Hey Refuge, welcome to Church at Home. Today is Palm Sunday, and what that means is that this coming weekend is Easter. So we're going to be having a Good Friday service together on Friday, of course, and then Easter after that. Now, obviously, we'd prefer to be together as a church family celebrating the resurrection of Christ on Sunday, but that's not currently possible. And so we're going to have to make do with celebrating Easter at home. Now, in the current format, you get to see my face every Sunday morning. The problem is that I don't get to see yours. And for Easter, I want that to change. We want you to be a part of our Easter service celebration. Here's how. The first thing is that you're going to pull out your smartphone, and we want you to record either yourself or your family saying these words, Christ is risen indeed. That's it. It's that simple. Just that phrase. You can be as creative as you want in terms of where you film yourself saying that phrase, but that's it. Christ is risen indeed. The second thing is specifically for parents of youth and children. We want you to, again, pull out your smartphone and record your kids answering this question, of course, if they're willing. How has Jesus changed your life? Or you can ask them a slightly different question. What do you love about Jesus? Now, these videos need to be short. In fact, they need to be under 15 seconds. Otherwise, the files will be too large. But that's it. How has Jesus changed your life? Or what do you love about Jesus? And then with both of these videos, you can email them to toshi at refugeabq.com by tomorrow, Monday, April 6th. So email them to toshi at refugeabq.com by tomorrow, April 6th. If you don't send us these videos, we'll go ahead and cancel Easter and we'll all drown our sorrows watching Tiger King on Netflix. Just kidding. But please do send us your videos. We want to see your faces. We want you to be a part of our Easter celebration. With that said, let's now worship together. Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Refuge Church at Home. We're glad that you're joining us whenever you are. Uh, today, this Sunday, is Palm Sunday. And we're going to worship in light of that. Uh, Palm Sunday is a moment in the church calendar where we reflect on in the life of Jesus, where he entered into Jerusalem, ultimately to go to his death on, a, on the cross. But it's this moment where he comes in on a donkey and people are laying palm branches on the ground and piece of fabric on the ground. And they're singing and they're proclaiming and they're shouting something very unique, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And as I was looking into what is the meaning of this word Hosanna, there's really two meanings that we can find. One is a, a, a word of celebration where we say salvation has come, and it's a word of, of praise, of joy. Celebration, uh, but saying that salvation has come at last. But it also can mean a plea or a cry, a desperate cry saying, save us, we pray. Save us, we beg. So let's start off our time in that. Before we do that, I want to read from Psalm 118 as God invites us into worship. This is starting in verse 21. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. It is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Another way that you could say that is Hosanna, O Lord. Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Let's go before God together in song and sing Hosanna. Yeah. 
have come is to give you praise. And you're welcome. You're welcome in this place. 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 We have come.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. As I mentioned just a moment ago, the word Hosanna is caught in this tension of being a celebration and being a cry for help. Let's sing Hosanna one more time as a cry for help, a cry for mercy, a cry for God to save us. silently or out loud if you feel comfortable. So let's take a time. First, maybe close your eyes. Breathe in, breathe out. Become aware in your mind and your heart of God. Allow the thoughts of this week to rush back into your mind and pray for yourself wherever you're at. or maybe who, who are distant in another state. I'm sure God will bring to mind those who he wants you to pray for. So take a time to pray for your friends and your family members, your neighbors and your coworkers. Take a moment to pray for those that you don't know. There are many around us who are uh, weak, maybe who are ill with the virus, those who go without. Allow God to lead you in prayer. Just pray for whoever comes to mind. in this. 
this short time of prayer that we've had together by praying the way that Jesus taught us, saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We're going to move now into a time of communion. If you don't feel like communion is right for you or for your family, feel free to skip this section. But for those of you who are going to take it, what you're going to do is you're going to take the bread and the juice or wine, whatever you have with you, and you're going to pass it to the person next to you. And they're going to rip off a piece of bread, dip it into the juice or wine. And as they're doing that, you can speak these words over them, the body and blood of Christ given for you. If you're just worshiping alone, we still encourage you to participate. And again, just remind yourself of the mercy and grace of Jesus that is yours, that is symbolized in the bread and cup. Let me read to you 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Go ahead and grab a Bible, open it up to Ephesians chapter 2, and have someone in your group read chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. You can go ahead and hit pause on the video, and then when you're done reading, hit resume. I want to begin our time together by asking you a question, having us do a little thought experiment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to list off a group of pairs, a, a group of pairs of, of different groups of people that are in tension with each other, hostile towards each other. And I want you to think about this question. What would it take for the hostility between those groups to be overcome? What would it take for the hostility between those groups to be overcome? You ready? Corporations and unions, boomers, and millennials, the wealthy elite, and the working poor, liberals, and conservatives, commercial developers, and environmentalists. What would it take for the hostility between those groups to be overcome? I mean, it's almost impossible to wrap our minds around, isn't it? It's impossible to wrap our minds around their rec reconciliation for the hostility to be overcome unless one group is eliminated, right? Unless one side is no more. It's impossible for us 
to wrap our minds around. Last week, we looked at Paul's message of grace alone in Christ, right? He talked about how we were dead. We were on the wrong side of the great cosmic battle between God and Satan. We were just following along with the world's trend. We were just doing whatever we want, and yet God made us alive in Christ. Out of his rich mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together in Christ by grace alone. What Paul's going to do now in Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22, is he's going to show how that message of grace alone helps to overcome the greatest hostility between the most antagonistic pair of Paul's own day and age. So go ahead, and if you haven't already, open up to Ephesians chapter 2. And let me just read the first couple verses, verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 2, verses 11 and 12. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands, remember that you, are, remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Okay, so this verse here, especially verse 11, is quite odd, especially to uh, those of us who are not super familiar with Paul's letters in the New Testament. Paul tends to talk about circumcision way more than I am personally comfortable with. What is he getting at with all this talk about circumcision? Believe it or not, the terms the circumcision and the uncircumcision were terms that actually first century Jews would categorize people into. The circumcision, meaning the Jews, and the uncircumcision, although the more literal translation of this Greek word in Ephesians 2 verse 11 is actually the foreskins. That's how he would refer, or first century Jews would actually refer at times to Gentiles as the foreskins. Now, I know that there are kids watching right now and participating in this, so I'm going to spare you and not go into too much detail on what exactly is going on with circumcision. But circumcision was a covenant marker uh, marking Israelite males, hallelujah for the women, right, that they didn't have to be similarly marked, marking out God's covenant people. And listen, here's the critical point. It was about way more than just a flap of skin or the lack thereof. Now, to give you an, uh, an analogy, think about what the term black means as an identifier to describe a person in America. If somebody is referred to as a black person or somebody takes that on as their own descriptor or identifier, that word black means way more than just skin tone, doesn't it? In fact, you can have darker skin and not be black. You can have lighter skin, at least relatively speaking, and be still considered black. The term black actually evokes an entire social history, doesn't it? It evokes the whole history of, of slavery and then Jim Crow segregation, racism up to the present day. Something similar is happening with the word circumcision and uncircumcision. The word circumcision evokes an entire social history. It, it evokes the struggle and tension of Jewish history. I think of the struggle and tension they experienced in the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th centuries B.C., when the Greek and Seleucid empires came in and in their attempts to Hellenize the world, tried to strip Jews of their Jewish heritage and culture. One of the ways they did that, at least in some cases, was actually a forced reverse circumcision. I have no idea how that medical procedure worked, but that was actually something that would happen, again, in an attempt to strip Jews of their Jewish culture. I, I think of the struggle and tension a little bit later on, uh, nearer to the time of Paul in the first century, the Roman disdain towards Jews, specifically over the issue of circumcision. Roman boys would make fun of Jewish boys because Jews were those people who were weird and backwards and would mutilate the perfect Roman concept of the body. And so it evokes that, 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 that struggle and that tension in their history. Of course, circumcision also evokes all the good things, right? The original covenant and promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The, their liberation from Egypt, their monarchy under David and Solomon. 
their hopes for a Messiah, right? Their unique, special bond with God, their hope for the future. All of that evoked, of that entire history, that spiritual and religious history evoked by the concept of circumcision. And what Paul is actually saying, I don't know if you notice, he's specifically talking to Gentiles here, Gentile Christians, and he's saying, I want to remind you that that whole social and religious and spiritual history, that whole story, its struggle and tension, but also its gifts and promise and hope, you weren't a part of it. You were totally outside that story. You were on the outside looking in. Without God, without hope. You know, you may have been excluded from the struggle, but you were also excluded from everything good. He continues in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, and in his flesh he made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. Let's pause right here. So, so there was, Paul is likely actually alluding to an actual wall. I think he's talking about obviously more than that. The, the dividing wall is certainly symbolic of the deep tension and struggle between Jews and Gentiles, the hostility between them that has lasted for so long. But there's also a literal wall that he's most likely uh, alluding to here. In the temple, in the Jewish temple, there was a wall, it's about four and a half feet tall, and it would separate the inner court where the, Israel, where the Jews could gather and worship and the outer court where the Gentiles could be. And so the Gentiles were stuck, even those who were interested in Yahweh, interested in Israelite worship, interested in the Jewish story, in the Torah, in the Old Testament, wanting to hope and believe in the Jewish Messiah. When they would gather and try to worship in the temple, they were outsiders looking in. They could see, it was only four and a half feet tall, but they were outsiders looking in, right? And so likely he's alluding to this physical wall that has been brought down because God is making a new temple, a new family of Jew and Gentile together. But of course, that dividing wall was symbolic of something far deeper, right? In the Jewish mind in the first century, I mean, there is no deeper hostility than between Jews and Gentiles. Gentiles looked down with disdain at Jews. They didn't like Jews. And the feelings were completely mutual. And what Paul is saying is that somehow, someway, In the cross of Jesus, that dividing wall, that hostility has come to an end. And Christ has made peace. Let's continue in verse 15. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace, and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So one of the ways Jesus, uh, Paul is saying here that Jesus has overcome the hostility or how God rather has overcome hostility between Jews and Gentiles in and through Jesus is by bringing the Jewish law to its conclusion. Paul says elsewhere, I think it's in Galatians, that the law was good, of course, but it was like a tutor. And the whole point of a tutor is to bring a child to the point where the tutor is no longer needed, right? Because the child has matured enough intellectually. And the same is true of the Jewish law, that it tutored God's people to the point of bringing them to maturity and making them and preparing them for Christ. But now that Jesus is here, the tutor is no longer necessary. So that's one of the ways that Paul is saying that the hostility has been brought to an end is that the Jewish law has been abolished. That thing that, that marked off Jews as separate and unique and distinct has now been replaced by a trust in the Messiah that is available to all. It's no longer works of the law, but it is trust in the Jewish Messiah through which we are marked out as God's people. But I think there's something else that's going on here because surely the hostility that existed between Jews and Gentiles was not just because of the law. 
also because of history, right? I mean, the enmity and the hostility between Jews and Gentiles has a very long, entrenched history. So much has been done. Things have been done in the past that cannot be fixed, that cannot be undone. So the question then is, how does Jesus' death overcome a hostility that goes way back in time? Uh, Diedrich Bonhoeffer was a early 20th century German theologian who led for some time um, an underground seminary in Nazi Germany, an underground training center for pastors. And the reason why it was underground was because it was illegal. And the reason why it was illegal is that Diedrich Bonhoeffer was part of what's called the Confessing Church. The Christians and the churches in Nazi Germany that were actively resisting Hitler's regime and Hitler and the Nazi message. And so the seminary was underground. And so uh, uh, during this time, Dietrich Bonhoeffer lived with the seminarians, teaching them, but also sharing life with them. And, and from that experience, he wrote this book, this, this classic work called Life Together. And one of the things he talks about in this book, he talks about Christian community and how many of us create a construct of what the Christian community is supposed to be like. He calls it a wish dream. We have this ideal of what the church and what Christian fellowship is supposed to be like. And then we take the Christian community as it actually is. And we judge it for not being our wish dream. For failing to live up to our own ideal. And so he's talking about this, how we create a wish dream, accuse then the church of failing to be what we think it should be. And then he says this, and I'm just going to read a little bit of, of what he says. God has already laid the only foundation of our fellowship because God has bound us together in one body with other Christians in Jesus Christ. And so we enter into that life not as demanders, but as thankful recipients. We thank God for giving us brethren who live by his call, by his forgiveness and his promise. We don't complain of what God doesn't give us. Rather, we thank God for what he does give us daily. And is this not what he has given us enough? Brothers who will go on living with us through sin and need under the blessing of his grace? Is the divine gift of Christian fellowship anything less than this, any day, even the most difficult and distressing day? And here's the part I really want you to listen to. Even when sin and misunderstanding burden the communal life. Did you catch that phrase? Even when sin and misunderstanding burden our life together, is not the sinning brother still a brother with whom I too stand under the word of Christ? Will not his sin be an occasion for me to give thanks that both of us live in the forgiving love of God in Jesus Christ. Thus, the very hour, he says, when we're disillusioned, when we realize the Christians that we're called to live in community with are not who we want them to be, he says, in that hour of disillusionment, it actually can become salutary, meaning God can use it to, to save us because it so thoroughly teaches me that neither of us can ever live by our own words and deeds, but only by the one word and deed which really binds us together, the forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. And when the morning mists of dreams and our ideals vanish, then dawns the bright day of Christian fellowship. Okay, so in case you missed some of that, because it's written, you know, 100 years ago, or, or maybe a little less than that, 80 years ago or so, what he's saying is that the tension we experience in Christian community. Right? He's not even talking about the tensions between Jews and Gentiles here. He's not talking about the tension of like Nazis and Jews or anything like that, right? He's just talking about the tensions that even those who are in Christ experience, even if they're the same race, the same ethnicity, the same socioeconomic class, there's constant conflict and tension within even a Christian community that is relatively similar to each other, relatively uniform. We know this, right? We have our own differences. We have our personality differences. There are misunderstandings. We miscommunicate. We sin against each other. And he says, when that dawns on us, it's an occasion for us to realize that we, along with our brother or sister who sins against us, who thinks so differently than us, who misunderstands us, 
Together we just both live underneath the forgiveness of Christ. <laughs> I think what Dietrich Bonhoeffer is actually getting at here is what Paul is getting at in Ephesians 2. Remember what he just told us last week? That all of us, Jew and Gentile together, we're dead in our trespasses. We're on the wrong side of the cosmic battle. We're just following along with the way the world was trending, doing whatever our hearts desire, just following our own passions. But God, remember that phrase? But God reached down out of his rich mercy, out of, the, out of the great love with which he loved us, made us alive together in Christ by grace alone. That message, when we realize the forgiveness and mercy we have in Christ, we can look at those who are different from us, even if our history with them is all sorts of complicated. Because there is sin, and there is tension, and there is brokenness, there's things maybe we've done, there's things that have done to us, and you can't go back and erase that history, can you? And yet, when we look at our brother or sister in Christ and realize that even those who have hurt us deeply, just like us, stand, if they stand at all, under the forgiveness given to us in Christ, Paul is saying, the wall of hostility can finally come down. Okay, I want you just to think about this. We'll have some time for the sermon discussion. But I want you just to think about now. If your name was on one side of the pair, if you created your own list and it was, you know, Toshi on one side or David on another, whatever, whoever you are, right? If your name was on one side of the pair, who might be on the other side? Is there a name that comes to mind? Maybe that's somebody even in the church, right? Maybe that's even a brother or sister in Christ that would probably be on the other side of that pair that you find because of your history, because of your past. There's deep hostility. And do you recognize what the gospel means for that relationship? <laughs> that the two of you together live, if you live at all, under the grace of Christ. And so that wall of hostility can come crashing down. Let me just read now the last few verses. Verse 19. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens. You are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God." What Paul is saying here, of course, he's continuing the thought. He's saying this is God's idea. This is God's idea to break down the dividing wall of hostility symbolized in the actual physical wall between the outer and inner court where the Gentiles could be and where the Jews could be. It is God's idea to break down the dividing wall of hostility between two sides of the most fiercely antagonistic pair in the world and create a new place of his residence, a new temple, a community of people that lives under the word of forgiveness and so lives in peace, even across their deeply entrenched differences. That's what Paul is saying here. Let me say it in, an, in another way, maybe even more simply. God's idea is to inhabit a family, a family in which maybe even no one naturally likes each other. But it's God's idea to inhabit a family in which no one perhaps even naturally likes each other that they might experience and exhibit his grace and love. You know, maybe as you think about whatever name would be on the other side of your pair, right? If your name was on one side, whose name would be on the other? Maybe that was a, a brother or sister in Christ, somebody in the church. Maybe it wasn't, right? I mean, I mean if you think about it, like, like so much of, even in the word pairs that I began this, this talk with, right? Those pairs are, are, are the pairs that, that so deeply divide our world, right? And obviously God wants his peace to emanate out and to spread out across the entire world, right? Of course. I think what Paul's getting at, though, is that God starts with his church first. 
God starts with his people first, right? We can, with, with John Lennon, you know, imagine perhaps a world with no divisions, with, with no pairs any longer. The point is that the church is the place where in the power of the Spirit, we go first. In the power of the Spirit, we go first. We don't just imagine, but we actually practice it. And as we practice the peace of Christ, we actually bear witness to our world that we don't just have to imagine. It is, in fact, possible through Jesus. Let's pray. God, would you take this message of grace and may it melt away our hostility. May it melt away our resentment. And towards all, of course, especially for those who are brothers and sisters in Christ, may we together, even across our differences, bear witness to your love and your beauty and your glory. May we become a family of diverse people from all sorts of backgrounds that experiences your presence and, show, and so bears witness to the world that a new humanity is possible. That may it start first in the church. Give us the strength and the power we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. We have provided some sermon discussion, so I encourage you to spend some time, whoever you are worshiping with this morning, to uh, have a sermon discussion and just really... Um, Share with each other how you feel like God is speaking to you personally through Ephesians 2 and, and through this message. I want to leave you now, though, with a, a word of benediction. What I want to do is, so I'm going to kind of, kind of go through the passage again, but I just want to highlight what Paul says is true of us. And so just go ahead and close your eyes and let these truths about who we are in Christ kind of wash over you. Although we were at one time without Christ, aliens from the family of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, no hope and without God, in Christ, here's what's true. We've been brought near. He is our peace. He has crushed the hostility between us. He has created one new humanity, making peace. He has reconciled us. He has proclaimed peace to us. He has given us access in one spirit to the Father. Verse 19, we are no longer strangers and aliens. We are citizens with the saints, members of the household of God. We are a temple, a dwelling place for God. My encouragement is for you to live in that truth this week.